another session of Creative University. I'm Peter Chadi, I'm co-founder with my wife Louisa of Creative University and also chairman of Creative Media. We have another good, really good session today. Um, very pleased to have Rachel Craig, who's an ANR exec, and we'll talk to Rachel very soon. Uh, that was, by the way, that was Neil Francis, that song. I always like to start with the song. That was Neil Francis, uh, which Rachel's latest artist signing and the song Teardrops. So what I plan to do is in every upcoming session, have the guest pick a song. So that's how we'll start. So today, uh, we'll keep it to an hour, go through a number of different things. First, let's start with just for many of you, because this is a really well attended session, which isn't surprising given the topic and the speaker. Uh, but this is going to be both a journey through how Rachel broke into the business um, and some lessons along the way and some advice to all of you out there who are thinking about the music world. But for anybody who's a music fan, she's going to lay out the special sauce, the secret recipe for how you're able to break an artist's music, their songs in this day and age with this tremendous volume that's coming from us. Rachel is as good as it gets when it comes to understanding that because she's right in the trenches doing it and, and has been seeing how the industry evolved. So very quickly, Creative University, the mission, the vision. You can find out more at the Creative University website. Uh, the link is going to be on the next page I show you. But it's for anybody in the media and entertainment and tech world, those of you who are passionate about exploring it in a broad swath, that's that's why we created Creative University. And so as I say here, it's an entirely new entrepreneurial hub that's meant to give you inspiration, access to great minds, of course, to understand their journeys, um, some collaboration with each other, and also sharing with each other stories that you have too and all the issues that you face as students, especially now, but also some real, real tangible, immediate industry mentorships uh, relationships and internships. We're absolutely critical. And that's what really differentiates us as well as access to great minds like Rachel. And the goals are what I stated. So you should spend time at the Creative University website. Here's the link right here. And you'll learn a lot, including upcoming sessions, but all the videos from the archive are there, but all kinds of information. Uh, so check it out. And the the program that we have for Creative University is the live Q&As and conversations like we're having today. And we started off just a couple weeks ago and our first speaker was TikTok CEO Kevin Mayer who just left, recently left Disney. So that's the kind of caliber we have coming into this program where you can't get these minds anywhere else. So we're really happy about that. Last week's session was pretty incredible. Um, I, I've gotten tremendous feedback about that. Randy Commissar, who's a best-selling author, um, a venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins, really discussed the art of creating a life while making a living. And you can find that on demand, and I really urge you to do that. Anum, if you're, if you're listening, maybe you can just give a couple thoughts on that. Um, well, actually, because this is not a live conversation, you can't do that, but you can send your chat comments and I'll say, I'll say it to everybody about the, um, you know, how interesting that was. Then we're at webinar, webinars, interactive sessions, student sessions and support. I'll talk about a little homework, why that's there, and then the other things I mentioned. The next session after this will be next week, next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, with the artist Radical Face, who I've mentioned several times, my favorite artist, my most streamed artist in the last five to 10 years, and Spotify proves that, Rachel happens to actually manage Radical Face among many others. So there is that connection there. But he's a true artist, a true artist. And so these are some things to check out the Family Tree Guidebook. Anybody who's interested in art and music, just look at the love that's in that book that's online. So go to the website, you can get that link and watch these videos before next week's session, watch these videos so you have that context going into the session next week. But for anybody who's an artist or anybody who's interested in the, in the music business, attend. And then some upcoming sessions beyond that, Jeff Clanagan, who's the president of Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud Network, 
another deeply experienced person in media and entertainment, Sarah Harden, who's the CEO of Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine, another very seasoned strategic mind, and then more sessions. Really quickly, homework, these are things that I encourage you to do if you're actively exploring this kind of world. Road Trip Nation, their motto is wondering what to do with your life, which is especially relevant right now, given all the kind of challenges you face. Go to roadtripnation.com, explore what they have, because it's really, really interesting. And then Radical Face, as I mentioned, check out the new Creative University YouTube channel, because you'll see all the various uh, webinars that we've had to date and some other videos. And then I really encourage you to check out the the spot, uh, the season two of Michael Lewis's podcast, Against the Rules. It's all about coaching and coaching that's going to be directly relevant to you students. So I really urge you to do that, including how science will help you understand certain behaviors. And then my spotlight question, bottom line, as I've said many times, is that we're here to help you. This is for you. We need to understand who you are. So if you want mentorships, if you want internships, then you gotta let us know more about you and reach out to us. Do the homework, do the application process, not as make work, but so you really, we understand who you are and what you're looking to do. And then also, I really encourage you to read my latest book because it gives you a broad overview of the business and the challenges of today. And so I really, uh, it's gonna give you a nice look at the video business, music business, esports, immersive technology, a nice context to help you understand a lot of the issues that we're going to be talking about and it's free so you can get it on at, at this link and it's entirely free we have a new partnership uh that i'm that we're exploring actively with this with, uh with this other giving company that's focused on students called one day immersion and next monday next monday for them they're having a webinar that's all about the introduction to film producing so that could be really interesting. So with that, that's a, there's a lot there. And Rachel, I see your, there you go. There's Rachel Craig. There's another Rachel Craig on here as well. <laughs> yes, the other Rachel Craig, do you mind uh, closing down your video screen? I, I'm, I'm not sure. Hold cool. On. Hey, I have a doppelganger. I'm into it. <laughs> okay. Anyhow, there, there we go. So, Rachel, great to have you. Thanks for having me. And I love what you're doing here. I've known Peter, what, for a little while now, over a year at yeah. least. Um, and we have a lot of mutual interest. And I heard he was doing this. And I think it is something that I wish that I had um, early in my career. So thank you for doing this. I think it's awesome. Well, it's, it's great to have you on. So thanks for attending and, and, and talking about your life and your career path and giving some of the secret sauce away that people will want to hear. But first, let me give a little background of you and then you can get into your journey. Okay. So there's so many things here, I'm going to read some of it. So Rachel is the director of A&R and management at Network Music Group. And she oversees the A&R de department for the US label, which includes scouting and signing new musical talent and developing the existing roster to maximize long-term success. And she'll talk about how she does that, but great artists. She's worked with the Beastie Boys, Jimmy Eat World, Mars Volta, Sarah McLaughlin, uh, Radical Face, as we've talked about. And interestingly, also, despite all this success and the fact that she's been in the business for quite some time and knows all the secrets, She's also pursuing her executive MBA as we speak because she wasn't busy enough. And Rachel, Rachel will tell you why she is doing that. So with that, Rachel, I'm gonna, just why don't you first lay out how you, um, just from the beginning, how you broke into the music business, why you wanted to pursue a career in the music business. And, and we'll start there and then get into some of the, maybe the roadblocks that you had, how you surmounted them and advice along the way, and then we'll break into the special sauce. Great, perfect. Well, thanks for having me, like I said. Um, I guess, um, not, not to go too long-winded, but I can tell you from the beginning, um, I was at the University of Alberta, and I was taking a degree in Earth and Atmospheric Sciences. And I remember at that very moment, I remember coming home and being like, 
even if I finish this degree, this is not what I want to be doing with my life. I don't know what I want to do with my life, but I know it's not this. And at the same time, I happened to meet a roadie who was the roadie for Jimmy at Jimmy Eat World at the time. And we fell in love. I was 18, as, as you do. You fall in love with a roadie. And then suddenly, bing, bang, boom, you tell your mom that you're moving to Los Angeles to go on tour with a rock band. How did, um, how did she like that? She did not like that. Um, she thought I was crazy. She thought I maybe needed a summer away from school to figure myself out and I would be back in September. Well, um, I moved to LA that summer and I was there for 16 years. Um, and that summer, I actually started going on tour with this band called the Mars Volta. Um, and if anybody knows them, they used to be at the drive-in. They were just crossing over to the Mars Volta. It was an absolutely hectic and amazing summer. Um, I learned so much just from physically being on the road, learning how, you know, touring works, learning the personalities involved in that, learning the business of that and how it all operates. And by the end of the summer, I was operating all of the, the merchandise lines for the Mars Volta and I was getting pretty good at it. And I was learning lots of things and I kind of went above and beyond because to me that was really fun and I got to do this huge, great adventure. And um, I was lucky enough, I came back, I started selling shoes on Melrose under the table because I'm Canadian and I couldn't get a job legally. Uh, and then I got really lucky because John Silva, who's one of the arguably best managers in the world, um, he really liked my hustle on the road. And he loved that I was, you know, doing a lot of stuff when I was selling merch for the Volta and I was giving him reports and I was making him a ton of money. And when an opportunity came up basically in his mail room, he called me. And I will say that was the moment that I realized that I was, I was working really hard, even though it was a really fun job and I could have totally just gotten drunk all summer and gone on tour with a rock band. I did that. But I also worked really hard and I made sure everybody around me knew how hard I was working. And that's why I got the call. And I got the call from the big, the big guy who noticed this little person doing this little thing. But I just got really lucky because I put myself out there. So then I started working for John Silva and I was 19 at the time. And I was, you know, basically starting in the mailroom. I started all the online stores. I hate to run, but let me ask you a question about Silva because yeah. Silva, for those of you out there, he is legendary. He's legendary in the business. So when you were this young kid and you were doing the things you, and you were hustling, like you said, and, and, and really selling the merch, you know, helping do that. How did you have the courage or how did you interact with him so that he, he noticed you? How did that happen? Yeah, I made sure that um, I guess management in general was just a, aware of what I was doing and that I was improving processes for them and selling more merch and delivering it in a way that was just more added value. So I was actually adding to their bottom line. I was making them a lot of money and I was giving it in a way that they were really happy with my reports and um, the way I was ordering and the way I was communicating with them. And I kind of was just really consistent with my communication. And also I was a nice person. So people liked me on the road, people liked working with me, management liked working with me. And generally speaking, I think that goes a really long way in this industry. People want to work with their friends. So if you're nice and you're competent, I, I think it goes so far, especially at the beginning. Now you're inherently nice because you're Canadian, of right? <laughs> so there's a plus there, but the rest of you, like that's a, that's a great lesson that you can be positive and you don't need to play the angles, but uh, a couple of things that you mentioned there, I think they're really interesting that are kind of universal themes that we talk about a lot. The, the hustle, so putting in the work, um, not necessarily doing the most glamorous things, but being willing to get in there and learning. And that's perhaps even the best kind of learning. And, and you, you certainly demonstrated that. And you said you put yourself out there. And then by putting yourself out there, you get noticed, established a relationship, and the relationship led to the big break. Totally. 100%. And, and that's something that I continued throughout my career. So I started out in the mailroom with John Silva and I helped them build and launch all the online stores for all of their clients in house. So I was doing the Beastie Boys, Mars Volta, Beck, Sonic Youth, um, you know, 
kind of Jimmy Eat World, a lot of these huge iconic bands, I was right at the cusp of when online stores were becoming a thing. And John wanted to bring that business in house. So I was at the forefront of that with him. So I really hustled. I started, I, I knew nothing about this industry. I knew nothing about online merchandising. I had been on the road, like, you know, for a couple summers. And then I, I did this whole, my, one of my first campaigns was the Foo Fighters and the Beastie Boys. And I'm a 19 year old kid working for the biggest manager in the world, launching this business that I didn't know what I was doing, but I worked really hard and I hustled and I kept just improving and learning and being curious. And that went so far. And I did the same thing just in, in a lot of different fields. Um, I also was really curious about promoters and live shows. So I started volunteering with Live, live Nation and Golden Voice. And while, Golden Voice- while, while you were doing that? While I was doing this. Okay, yeah. so this was extra credit, essentially. This was just curiosity, yeah. This was just, I had some friends who worked at Golden Voice and then they would hire me to do random festivals. I was at the second ever Coachella. Um, I got to be a golf cart driver for artists and ended up going, um, you know, that ended up being a 12 year relationship with Golden Voice where I was the only non-Golden Voice employee who did artist relations um, because they knew me, they trusted me. I had built this relationship. I had kind of, you know, gr grown with the company. Um, and that all stemmed from this curiosity of like me wanting to know how festivals were produced. What does that mean? Like, how are they run from the back end? Like, how are you involved in that? What team is involved in that? Mm -hmm. How can you have your artists play a festival? And I was just curious and I met the right people. And they, again, I was nice. I was competent. I did the job and then I continued that relationship on. And, and again, that has really given back tenfold for me um, with those relationships. So um, a couple of things. Yeah. I want to go back to when you were talking about the online merchandise and you were experimenting. So when you were experimenting, it's you were experimenting because there was no, there weren't necessarily best practices on it. it the, the business was what it was, but you, it sounds like you were creating it at the same time without a rule book and exactly. so experimentation, right? Exactly. And it was, it, it's like, it's like any experimentation phase, you experiment, you see what works and what doesn't work, you refine, you keep going. And uh, that was really, you know, like two and a half years of doing that and figuring out all the best processes from what, what merchandise lines to create, to what was selling most, to how to, how to package it, how to run a warehouse, how to navigate um, doing marketing campaigns with new artist releases, like different packages, et cetera. So it was a lot of different things that we just kept refining and getting better at. Okay, great. And so you took us through the Golden Voice relationship. Yeah. Then, then next after that. Oh, so, um, so it's really hard to go from uh, being in the mail room of you know a major management company um, to to managing. So so I guess you know if you were in the mailroom of the Foo Fighters, which I was, to going to be part of the management team of the Foo Fighters, that's a really hard jump. And it takes years and years and years and years. And I, I, I recognized that and I knew after spending two years in the mailroom, I knew I wanted to get into management. And I knew it was a really hard leap internally at Silva because of the level of their clients. So I started putting the word out and I, again, I just started networking. I started talking to a bunch of people. I was really curious. I took people out for coffee dates. I showed up at shows. I just networked and hustled and asked a lot of questions. And then this job opportunity came up um, doing day-to-day -day management at Network Music Group. And, um, and it was great. I got to help with a lot of amazing artists. That's when I started working with Sarah McLaughlin and that whole team. I got to work with Stereophonics and Dido, um, all kind of in the management role. And then I started growing as a manager myself and then started taking on my own clients. So it was really my pathway to, to become a manager was to really start from the bottom up, but, but kind of have a pathway rather than managing the Foo Fighters. When you say that network, be, that position became available, how did you even learn about it? And was there a relationship involved in that one? 100%. So I, again, friend of a friend. My friend Phoebe, um, her boyfriend was the film and TV guy at, uh, at Network. I went for dinner at their house. Again, just started asking around and he called me one day and was like, this position just opened up. Nobody knows about it. You need to come in for an interview. Okay. And that's how I got the job. Okay. JT. <laughs> yeah. And so, and then next, and then we'll go into the, the next part of the, the discussion. 
Yeah. So I love management. It's my heart. It's, it's kind of where I came from. Truly. Um, I spent a lot of years doing it. I still do it. But about eight years ago now, Terry McBride, our CEO of network said, Hey, I really want you to start doing A&R for the label. And I, and it was because again, my passion for music, he recognized, he recognized that I was always sending them great music. I was always going to shows anyway. I was doing A&R for my management clients. So I was really doing a lot of the things anyway. I just wasn't getting paid for that role. Um, and, and I said, no, I said, I'm not, I'm not an A&R person. I'm a manager. And then he's like, okay, you can keep your clients. Just try out signing a few things, working with it, growing. Um, and now eight years later, um, here we are. It's, it's probably 90% of my business. And, and part of that is um, me understanding the value of intellectual property nowadays mm -hmm. and understanding that the business that I want to be in as I get older is the IP business. It's not necessarily a service business. So um, I think they go hand in hand and I can unpack that a little bit, but- By the way, I, IP for those of you out there who don't know, that's intellectual property, that's the song. So, you know, the, you know, the rights that are part of the song. So I would imagine when you're talking about the IP, you're talking about the songs and the copyrights and all that. Exactly. So what we do in the music business is sell feelings, but that intellectual property is the thing that we're selling. It, it is the, the masters, it's the publishing, it's the branding. So you are building a business when you build an artist and that intellectual property is, is the package is the thing you are selling. So as a manager, you're overseeing a lot of that IP building, but you don't own or you don't kind of necessarily directly own that IP, the artist does, and that's great. But in on the label side, you're able to build that IP, but have an ownership stake of it. And that's fundamentally the difference between obviously, you know, manager's ownership stake versus versus label and so you know i think we recognize that at a certain point i might not want to be taking calls 24 7 um <laughs> with with artists and i still love it it's still something i'm passionate about at, but at three at three in the morning yes you're yeah gonna yeah there. yeah exactly but um but terry really showed me the light as far as the value of ip and a lot of the value you could bring to it and kind of recognizing that i wanted to probably navigate a little bit more into that world rather than a peer management business so now i'm actually um split between the two. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna, for a, a seemingly easy question, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily easy given all the things you've done, but what are the lessons that, as you take away from all the various roles that you played across the business and where it's led you to today, for the students out there who are interested in all of this, yeah. what, what are some takeaways that, you've, that you can give them? Yeah, I mean, obviously being competent is very important so you know at the end of the day you're trying to add value to others whether it's a client whether it's people in your organization whether it's to get the job they're just looking to do their thing and they want somebody to come in and add value to it so you need to look at every scenario and say how can i be helpful how can I add value to this situation? And that's something that I just consistently did and really pushed for. And it really just, it made people want to champion me. It made people say, I want her on my team because I just kept adding value and pushing and pushing and pushing. So that was something that I think um, people get given a job and they do their job. I don't think the music industry is for that type of person. The music industry is for entrepreneurs. The music industry is for people who look outside the box, who want a creative field, who don't want a set pathway in a career, because the music industry is whatever you make of it. There is endless possibility, but there's also no roadmap. It makes it very difficult to say, oh, just do X, Y, and Z. You're not a doctor. You can't just get a degree, you know, do, do your training and then become a doctor. This is not how the music industry works. It is an ever growing process yeah. and you need to keep learning and growing with it. Otherwise you will get stuck at a desk being somebody's assistant forever. Yeah. And one other thing, and then we'll get, we'll get into the next part of it, but certainly you weren't afraid of taking jobs that, that maybe like mailroom as an example, oh, yeah. or when you were at Coachella and you were learning the business by, by, driving the golf carts for art oh, yeah. things like that. So you weren't getting paid for that, but nonetheless, it all led to the power of your experiences. 
Totally. And I, I still, I still, I still do that all the time. And, and even for years, like another thing I did as I was really interested in how award shows worked. So I found a woman who worked for the foreign press who needed an assistant and I offered it for free. And I got to go to the Academy Awards, to the Screen Actors Guild, to the Grammy Awards, backstage, hanging out with everybody because I, I was curious. I put it forward, I offered my services, and then I got to, you know, I got to go do all these things. And it's something that, to me, that's a free education. Yeah. That is learning without paying for it. It's, it's time. Um, yeah. And it's something that I, I still, I still to this day do. When I'm very curious about something and I want to learn it, I'll offer up my services for free in exchange for information. And by the way, so important because the more, the more times you put yourself out there, everybody, obviously the more chances you have to establish a relationship that will that will generate an opportunity for you down the path, even when you least expect it. And that's a recurring theme from all the speakers that we've had. And um, you know, I, I think that now in this kind of period where everybody's trying to figure out their lives, think about that. Think about certain things you can do that to put yourself out there, even in this virtual way. And um, that's part of the purpose of Creative University, of course. So let's get into the whole entrepreneurial nature of the business and getting more into like, okay, here's the problems and how you solve them, how you approach them. Because one of the things you talk about is you have to be on top of the business, not only on top of the business where it is today, but where it's going. And technology is driving a lot of that. So when you, even in the past, when in the music business, you had to be entrepreneurial, but nothing like you have to be today where you have to really explore all different kinds of opportunities. So the topic was, the main topic was, breaking an artist, breaking a song in this world that's just immersed in all this music. So take us through what you do and how you approach it and where and how artists can really do that and songs can break through. Okay, I mean, it is a bit of a loaded question because it, you know there's obviously no roadmap, but there's a lot of best practices that we can do. Um, and uh, this just in, there's no silver bullet. There is not one thing that you can do that's going to skyrocket you to success. So um, I always start by saying there's a lot of hard work <laughs> involved in all of this. Um, and it, it is a mix between art and science because we are selling feelings and we don't know when they're going to connect or how they're going to connect sometimes until we release them. And sometimes it's the right song, wrong time. Sometimes it's wrong song right time you know um you it's really hard to predict a lot of things in our industry but there's a lot of best practices that we can focus on and i think now is actually an amazing time for somebody to move into the music industry space because a intellectual property is worth more than it's ever been worth streaming the long-term value of it is exponentially more than it was i mean we're kind of hitting hitting a new era uh, people seem to think they're not making any money. No, streaming streaming is very valuable, um, and we're we're in an upward trajectory as a as an industry. Yeah. But by the way, on that, just a, a factoid there. So up from from the time of piracy, internet piracy, when that's the original Napster, the music industry was decimated over the years, uh, and there was just nothing but doom and gloom from two, like 1999 to 2015 or 16, and and people were. Uh, there was so much uh, denigrating streaming as being part of the problem too. And then all of a sudden, then things started changing significantly. And, all, and we ended 2020 with a, uh, a global recorded music industry that's worth $20 billion, not including live, by the way, just the recorded music industry. And one of the biggest analysts out there predicts that the music business by the time we reach 2030, so in 10 years, and this is just recorded, will more than double to 45 billion. So that's the context. Yeah, and I think, you know, that a lot of that is because the mass um, onboarding of people to Spotify, to Deezer, to Apple, to really utilizing these streaming services. And once you hit that mass appeal, you get the people who start free and then they start paying. And if you really convert that on a global scale, suddenly you've got, you know, millions and millions and millions more people paying for music than, you know, the, the small per percentage who bought your album or who bought your digital single. So it's really becoming, you know, uh, something that's going to continue to grow and continue to grow in adoption, you know, and continue to increase in value, like you said. So it's a really good time to get the music industry on that side, but it's also, a lot of the barriers, which used to be the physical barriers, 
of entering the music industry and, and what I call the dog and pony show, which is you had to know somebody, you had to know a guy who let you in. There's a lot of nepotism. It's you got to be at the right club at the right time. I think that that still happens, but there is such room for smart people to come in and just be great at what they do and have a total space in the industry. So I'm really excited about that. I think people nowadays, I think there's two ways to get in the industry. One is to know somebody and to be a hustler. Yes, that's great. But two is just to be smart, be really freaking smart, know your stuff, continue to grow. I think that will pay dividends. And there's a lot of young kids that are crushing it right now because they're super smart. They figured out platforms, they're launching artists and you know, all these old cats are looking to them to tell them what to do. And I think that just says a lot about the time. So I think there's, there's a lot of space here. And so when we're talking about the revenues that, you know, those massive numbers now streaming is responsible for something like 80% of that. So it's think about that. The recorded music industry is about 80% driven by streaming now. So Rachel, one of the things we talked about last week, and I learned a lot, were the three mechanisms, as you call them, to drive mm. streaming. Yeah. And, and the success. So in terms of giving the best possible chance for an artist or yeah. a song to break out, can you take us through that? Totally. So um, think about streams and your source of streams. Where do they come from? If you think about three different buckets, you have an organic bucket. Your organic bucket is your followers. Those are people that are naturally being driven to your profile because they follow you. They are fans. Then you have your algorithmic bucket. That's what we call it. And that's your radio stations. That you, that's your discovery. That's your personalized playlists. These are all based off of an algorithm that Spotify, Spotify's backend feeds music into you based off of your listener preferences. So that's really important. And then you have your editorial and your editorial is, you know, all, all of the official Spotify playlists. And a really interesting trend is that you see those Spotify playlists now, and some of them are half algorithmic and half editorial, which means that the first 10 songs for me are different than the first 10 songs for Peter because the algorithm feeds us based off of our preferences, you know, different songs. And then the rest of the playlist is curated by a human. So I think a lot of people in the industry get really hung up on editorial and as they should, it drives millions of streams and it's a really quick way to break artists, but it is a risky way to break artists. And I say that it's because if you want your entire career to be held by one or two people who just decided or didn't decide to playlist your song, I don't think you're setting yourself up for success. I think that is not really a business strategy. Um, so to me, editorial is just getting harder and harder. There's 40,000 songs a day that are uploaded to Spotify. How is, how are those playlisters going to find your song? And it's not just hoping they get it by uploading it on the back end portal. That's not really a strategy. So we like to focus as a company on building organic and algorithmic streams. And okay, those so let's talk about edit editorial a little bit though. Yeah. Um, so let's take Spotify as an example. Mm -hmm. So you say that it's really, really hard to get on a playlist, um, Spotify or some of the others. It's really, really hard. And you, I think you told me you can't really contact anybody at Spotify to do that. There's, I mean, you can, if officially you're not supposed to, but there's obviously direct, um, direct relationships that happen. But so how does Spotify identify for, um, what should be on their editorial? How well, do they it's a couple, it's a couple different mechanisms and it, it, again, you know, they haven't unveiled the entire curtain to us. Yeah. Um, obviously the first thing you do is you pitch via your artist um, portal and that goes directly into editors. However, the algorithm filters it and it filters it based off a streaming profile. So there's sonic qualities of your song that it'll make sure that if it's a rock metal song, that it's not being fed into acoustic playlisters. So and there's that's not through tagging, that's just through its own sound characteristics. Exactly. So the algorithm basically just pre vets, uh, does the first kind of set of combing it right mm -hmm. before it even gets to an editor. So they, they go ahead and do that. They also look at things like your follower count, your engagement, um, you know, your marketing drivers, like what, how, what are you doing to drive fans to our platform? Because if you break down what Spotify's business is, they want 
as many people as possible for as long as possible on their platform. Yeah. So if you show to them, hey, as a partner, I'm driving all of these people to your business. Now I'm asking you to support me. So it becomes a more of a mutual conversation. It's not like, oh my God, please give me an editorial playlist. I need it. Otherwise I, I don't have a career. It's like, no, it's I'm adding value to you. You're adding value to me. So a lot of what we do is we pitch the marketing drivers. Um, we pitch, you know, followers, we pitch engagement metrics, we pitch it through the portal. And then, and then we try to, you know, delineate which curators are, are best. Basically. Okay. So apart from editorial, you were getting into, and by the way, if any of you out there have questions, feel free to send them across in the chat button down below. Uh, and then I will ask Rachel, uh, I'll sprinkle them in during this talk. But then as you approach things, you said editorial is not necessarily the, the best way to go. It's part of the, the triumvirate, but how do you approach things? Well, I, I see that as the icing on the cake. Okay. So the things as a label and as a team and as a manager that I focus on are followers and are the algorithm. So followers are the easiest. It's how can you convert the people on your Instagram? How can you get new fans to follow you? How can you keep driving people to follow you so that every time you release a song, they listen. And you really want to be strategic there because if you have 300,000 followers and then every time you release a new song, you have 300,000 people that are immediately fed your music, that's a pretty good starting place. And it is also the place that Spotify pays attention to. So if you release a new song on a Friday, if the metrics are really good over the weekend, if you are driving your fans to it, they're engaging with it, they're not skipping it, they're saving it to their own playlist. Those are all really great engagement metrics. So come Monday, you might see it on a playlist. You might start seeing it being fed into Discovery Week weekly um, algorithmic playlists. You, you can see if a song is engaging really well, it spikes in the data and that's what Spotify pays attention to. They look for outliers, positive outliers, and then they find ways to place those songs. So you want your music to be a positive outlier. So how are you gonna do that? We're gonna put a lot of money behind marketing when we release that song. We're gonna do digital marketing. We're gonna do radio. We're gonna try to have syncs, you know, all these marketing drivers to drive people to that song. So truly, you know, come Monday morning, we're, we're in a good place. We're, we're looking like we're gonna get some more additional playlists. Um, people are gonna, engage really well with that song, share it with their friends, et cetera. Okay. And then and, the, the oh, algorithm, ahead. the algorithmic piece, piece is super interesting. So, so there's lots of ways that the algorithm works and if not to get too techy, but we're total nerds here, me and Peter both. Um, it's, yeah. it, it's machine okay. learning. It's, it's, um, it's artificial intelligence. It is very smart. It learns, the preferences of each individual user and it feeds it songs that it thinks it's gonna like. And it does that because Spotify's entire business strategy is keeping you on the platform for as long as possible. And what drives you off the platform when you don't like a song. So they don't want you skipping songs. They don't want you turning it off. They want you happy and engaged. So they're gonna feed you songs that they think are gonna keep you happy and engaged. So, um, we need to figure out the mechanisms to grow your algorithm so that your song gets fed alongside other songs so that you continue to grow out al algorithmically. So I'll use an example. So if you look at your fans also like section, so every artist has 12 songs, 12 artists that they're connected to on their fans also like, right? Of those artists, if your number one releases a song on a Friday, come Monday, you will see your song spike. Why is that? It's because your song is being fed into their community through the algorithms. So they release a new song, great. A bunch of people are on the artist profile. They're playing the radio station of it. They're listening to their Discover Weekly. They're gonna listen to their new song. And what's right behind their new song? Your new song. Why? Because you are very closely connected to that community, which tells Spotify that your listeners and their listeners are very similar. So a lot of what we do, and this is again, might be going into it to in depth, but a lot of what we do on the marketing side is we try to connect communities so that we look at maps and we say, hey, what is our aspirational communities? What are some artists that are 
really engaged, always releasing music, and that are a little bit bigger than us so that we can be linked to them. So every time they release music, we're being fed into that music and we're part of that community. And a lot of what we do is map communities, map sonics, figure out where our pathway is to connect the dots and continue to grow that algorithm. And it's been super successful, like so, thousands and thousands of streams successful. So when you say mapping yeah. sonics, what do you mean by that? So um, there's seven sonic characteristics that um, kind of overview, I guess, the algorithm of Spotify. And we have ways, and this is, in, this is internal, so I wouldn't suggest anybody else can maybe do this, but Spotify does it. Um, we can actually map the sonic characteristics of songs to understand what playlists they should be kind of with or what community they should be with. Okay. And then when you, so if an, if an artist that you're related to is releasing uh, a new song, let's say on Monday, Mm -hmm. And so you can expect a spike yourself. So part of what you do is you're looking at the artists you're related to and their release schedule. Yes, and 100%. So instead of trying to market to my existing artists, if I'm an artist, I'm not going to market to my artists. I'm going to wait till somebody in my community releases a new song, and then I'm going to market to their community because I want their community to be my community. Yeah. So rather than just marketing to your own people, that's great. Let's expand your people into other similar communities to build a bigger community. Okay. I have a question from Anum. What would you recommend for breaking new artists who are just starting out? How can they show they're adding value to editorial curators and do marketing with small budgets? That's fair. Um, a lot of times you have to release a couple songs, I would say, before you start getting any sort of traction. The only way to get a lot of traction quickly is through editorial. So you have to know somebody, you have to pitch it correctly, you have to have marketing drivers. Um, and that's really hard for new artists who might not have the connection, right? So you have to release a couple songs and start building a real audience. You have to do it the hard way. So there's an easy way and a hard way. The easy way is you get lucky, you know somebody, you pitch it, they put it on editorial. The hard way is you start building a true, real audience that engages with your music. And editorial, I would imagine that means that you as an artist and you're unknown, but you have a song that you'd like to, um, you know, put on, put up on Spotify or something like that. Then what you do is you reach out to anybody you're connected to through your social pro, your social profiles, yeah. and their friends and their friends. So editorial is not just the traditional editorial, but it's everybody's networks, correct? Kind of, yeah. I mean that you continue. Obviously, if you think you belong in a certain community those are your audience targets. So those are the ones you should be approaching. I will say um, a fun, I wouldn't call it a trick, but uh, a really quick way um, to immediately start getting traction is by collaboration. So if you collaborate with somebody who's in an aspirational community of yours, then you will be intrinsically linked on the algorithm and it will also feed your song into their community. So we're doing a ton of collaboration, whether it's a feature vocal, whether it's a remix or a rework. So if you have a, a new song and you're like, oh, my aspirational community is, you know, this X, Y, and Z, find somebody in that community to collaborate with. Find out who they're, how many followers that they have. You'll be able to double your follower count within months. Interesting. So tell us then, let's use a real world example of the artist that we started this session with, Neil Francis. Oh, cool. Yeah. So with Neil, how did you break him? Well, um, it's a duo. Well, yes. <laughs> and, yes. And, um, and I just signed them uh, three weeks ago. Ah. Uh, actually, more than that, maybe, maybe four weeks. Um, but I can tell you how I'm going to break them. Okay. <laughs> so um, A, first and foremost, we have a TikTok moment happening right now that we're going to add fuel to the fire. So TikTok, obviously you guys know the platform. It is a very, very quick way to get pretty immediate engagement on a song. It's a pretty organic platform. It's hard to um, create a viral moment on TikTok. Like if I, us as a label, we try not to create viral moments on TikTok, but we do do influencer campaigns. So we're going to do influencer campaigns with the song, going to keep it growing on TikTok because that seems to be connecting to our streams. So first and foremost, you know, that's what we're going to do. But then we're going to work on release cadence. So rather than just randomly releasing songs, seeing it spike up and then go back down to where we started, we're going to release a song and up here, this is about the three to four week range where you're getting algorithmic, you're getting editorial, you have good and fan engagement and you hit a peak, everybody hits a peak and then they start going back down. 
the key to all of this is to release another song before the peak goes down to the bottom. Because you think about climbing a mountain, you want to keep going here because you want the, the layered effect, right? So every time you're at the peak, you want to start here. You don't want to start down from the bottom again. You want to wait till you're at the top and you want to keep going and getting higher and higher and higher. So every time you release a new song, you try to get it at that peak to release another new song. And that's what we call a layering approach. So in a year, um, you can pretty much mark my words on this, uh, with Neil Francis, a new signing, uh, we're gonna do a continued cadence strategy. It's gonna layer, we're gonna have obviously a ton of the traditional marketing. And I can tell you their profile now compared to a year from now is gonna be double, at least. So with Neil Francis, the duo, um, in one year, over the course of a year, do you recommend for an artist? Do you recommend releasing an you know an album as so in one in one moment releasing multiple songs? Or since you're talking about this cadence, is mm -hmm. the new world order just having releases when it gets like this and it starts going down, releasing another? And so, are you saying that it's better not to release an album? So there's a couple strategies here there's the streaming strategy and there's you know a press strategy then there's a touring strategy then there's a radio strategy you know there's all all these things are not not necessarily the same thing and i would say a streaming strategy spotify only cares about singles yeah you release an album and they say okay when's the next song out and you're like i just released an album and they're like doesn't matter they only care about singles so you are setting yourself up for failure if you release one or two songs and then an album and then, and then you're hooped. You got, you got no more songs to work with um, unless you're extremely prolific. So um, albums to us are part of the press strategy. They're part of the radio strategy. They're part of a touring strategy, but they're not part of a streaming strategy. Yeah, which is interesting because again, 80% of recorded music revenues are generated by streaming. Exactly. In the aggregate. So let's, we don't have that much time. And by the way, again, send your questions in guys. Um, but let's talk about voice and how important voice activated, you know, Alexa and all of these are to the music industry now and oh. lessons to give to people about, about. Yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a really interesting one. Our company about four years ago was starting to see the writing on the wall with, you know, voice activation. So it's the Alexa play coffee house. But how is Alexa going to know to feed your song up when you say Alexa coffee house? Well, you have to tell it, you have to learn. It has to learn your metadata. So something we started doing was doing rich meta tags along with our song. So the machines know what it is, how it's tagged and how to feed it up. Um, and that's something that we're gonna see the dividends of probably in two years when voice activation becomes exponential. And that's every time you get in your car, every time you get home, you know, talking to devices, Siri, you know, your voice activation says certain tag words and you need to make sure your music has those tag words. So um, we do that. How important is voice today in terms of just overall listening? Um, I don't know the actual industry statistics about that, but I would say as a company, I think we're about nine, nine to 10% of our revenue comes from voice activation. Okay. And you see that growing significantly. Yeah. Okay. So uh, getting a little bit more granular about that, what does that mean? If you want to prep your music for the best possible pickup in voice, which is going to be increasingly important to success, yeah. how do you do that? Well, the problem is that if you are an independent artist there i don't know of like tune core cd baby actually has the ability to do rich meta tags um we go through different distributors just like the majors so we can include 50 custom meta tags with each song for easy searchability so if there is a company that you can use and there's so many distribution companies out there that can allow you to have that i think you're going to set yourself up for success in two years it's a bit of a long play we're seeing the benefits of it now um but yeah it's kind of a weird one so well again that's one where there's no playbook to how best to be able to do that and so it's constant experimentation being entrepreneurial but rich meditating sounds like it's a volume game to a certain extent too so you're trying to anticipate okay if if you wanted to be on coffee house what are all the different tags you can put on this song to exactly. optimize your chances to be part of that playlist Exactly. And there's, no, there's no rule book on any of that. It's just no, and it's all AI. So it's it's understanding um, what a what the algorithm 
um, the AI is making and what factors feed into that is really important. And we've kind of delineated some for Spotify, which is why we have this information, but things like Amazon and Apple, they all have different algorithms. So it's figuring out what feeds into their algorithm and figuring out ways to maximize it, which is the nerd stuff we all love. <laughs> so Chloe, I'm going to get to your question in a second, but how important, given all these, this talk about algorithms, you're a and &R, you're head of a and director of a &R over there. How important are ears still? Good old fashioned ears. Very, I think they're, they're the, still the most important thing. But, you know, I think there's, um, you have to feed into certain laneways, I guess, in order to be successful. And I actually think it's homogenized a lot of music, if I'm being totally honest, because now you he hear artists who just sound like indie pop or who just sound like you know bedroom pop and it's like is this true art or are they just making music to fit into this laneway mm -hmm. so i think ears are so important because it's the thing that starts new movements so i think there's ways to break still ways to break original creative new artists and when you do you're in a laneway all your own and i think you know art obviously artists like billy eilish have kind of proven that which she didn't really fit sonically into anything that was happening at the moment, but she started her own trends. And now everybody does the Billie Eilish, you know? So I think I'm interested in, in, in a little bit of A, a little bit of B, figuring out ways to maximize the laneways that already exist, but also the creativity piece. People still want to buy into people. I don't want to buy into a, you know, a random playlist thing. I want to buy into an artist. I want to follow a human that I find compelling. So I sign people based off of like a feeling of emotion. Are they compelling? Are they charismatic? Do they make something that matters? I think that's the piece that algorithms can't get. And sometimes you need to break radio. And when I say break radio, it means have something that doesn't work on radio at all. And then when it does, it's in a laneway of its own. We did that with Passenger. Everybody told us he was a sad leprechaun <laughs> until he was the number one song in America. So, you know, he didn't fit at radio and we had to break radio to get him to fit. And I think those are the artists that I'm the most excited about. I love that description of Passenger, uh, Sad Leprechaun. By the way, great artist, great artist. <laughs> if you like mellow, kind of folksy, another great artist. Okay, Chloe, you have a question here. a &R often feels like a race and a competition. How do you convince artists they should come to network over major labels? And how do you manage being disappointed when it doesn't work out the way you had hoped? Good question. This, this is a great question and it's something that you deal with a lot. It is 100% very competitive. Uh, I think artists nowadays have a lot of options. And for me, it's about alignment. And I use that word a lot because what I don't want, my life is too short to sign an artist and have them disappointed or to sign an artist and have them yelling at me every day because I'm not delivering what I said. What I want to do is find out what the artist wants, convey clearly what we can deliver as a company confidently, because I am very confident in what we can deliver as a company and see if we are true partners together, because I do not sign artists where I don't think we're aligned. Even if it's a great signing, if they tell me step one, they want to go to top 40 radio, we're not the right team for you. We build artist careers. We don't start at radio. And if that's what you want, if you want to be on the cover of a magazine and you want top 40 radio, we are not your team. So, a lot of what I do is vet artists very clearly and then just convey to them the value add we bring. And if we can come together aligned, that's really when great part, long term partnerships happen. And those are honestly the artists I want to sign anyway. And yes, I'm super disappointed. I, I can tell you the laundry list of artists that I've lost and it is devastating. Um, I, I was at the first Billie Eilish show in, you know, in, in um, I think it was in Hollywood. You know, I've seen all these artists play for the first time ever. You know, you're in the room, you're with 20 other a &R people. It's devastating when you lose, but then you get, you get the right ones when you want to get the right ones. And honestly, I think adding value and continually showing artists that you're adding value to their career, artists talk to artists. So I've gotten more artists from saying, actually, Rachel's doing her job. We really like network. You should go talk to her. And that's what I want. That's my long play. So yes, always disappointed. I, it's always a competition. You're always trying to run to things before anybody else. But the long play is just to be freaking great. <laughs> I love it. Amen to all that. So uh, good question, Chloe. Send other questions in if you have them. 
So with an artist, um, Ben is coming up next week. Yay! The Radical Face. Um, he was on a different label, a smaller label in Germany, I think you said? Yes, more music, yeah. Okay, so more music. So what, were, what was the reason why he came to you and what does he expect from you as his and network? So, um, so full disclosure, I only manage uh, Ben. I do not do A&R, he's, he's no longer signed to Network Records. But when I discovered him, he's one of those, like I said, true artists. He doesn't fit on the radio. He doesn't fit a, a traditional press. He is the real deal. And I heard the song Welcome Home and nobody knew about this song. And he, it had been out for three years on more music. And still nobody knew about this song. Nobody knew about this artist. So I flew to Jacksonville, Florida and I sat down with him and I said, I don't know why I'm here, but I love your music. And I really feel like we need to partner together. And it's been a partnership ever since. Uh, we've continued to grow it slow and steady and, you know, gotten some pretty major wins, wins along the way. He's the theme song for Nikon globally, has been for the past eight years. Um, you know, which, he sells, which song? Welcome Home. No, oh, Welcome Home. Okay. Yeah, we've gotten over 50 film TV trailer syncs. Um, we expand him in a lot of different creative avenues. He sells to a thousand people around the world and he's never had a single radio play or very little press. And how do we do that? It's the long game. It's real fans. He's a real artist. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, and again, I for anybody who was, um, you saw the deck at the beginning, and I'll show it a little bit at the end too. And you can stick around past the hour if you'd like and ask more questions, Rachel. If you have a little bit more time, if anybody yeah, has, right. but I really urge you to attend next Tuesday session because it's going to be a very different kind. Talk about the creative process and do a little bit of exploration and digging into Ben's site, Radical Face, because you'll see like that family tree document that's up there, the handbook, I think the guidebook. Yeah. It's, it's just pretty incredible. I just uncovered it myself uh, and I was blown away at, at how meticulous the art is. So it's, it's not just the songs, it's the whole world that he created. And he's, he's, um, he's also not just a musician, he's an, uh, an artist from drawing and visual artist, that, that kind of thing too. Exactly, I mean, in his creative process is amazing and he has a lot to say about it and a lot to teach people. He's, um, I learn from him every day and he's genuinely one of the most genius people I've ever met. So I could not recommend him more and that's not just me being mom. Um, I, I, I truly still work with him because he is a legitimate genius human. Okay, so I have a question here from Jeff. Jeff says, or ask, what, does she, what do you think about revenue streams in the age of COVID and concert capacity being limited? Do you expect merchandise will become more reliant on digital sales versus in person? I mean, everybody has to shift. We had to shift overnight. Um, our, our, luckily, our business was not at, very impacted by COVID, but obviously the concert business is. So if they don't shift, they will die. Same thing with merchandise, it's gotta be online. If they don't shift, they're gonna die. And that's just the new normal. So following up on that, and you did have to shift your business really overnight. Um, what are some things that you have found that have worked that maybe have surprised you that you didn't anticipate? Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that? Um, I will say we expected our business to go down 10 to 15%. And it turns out when people are in a global pandemic, they listen to a lot of sad music. So we, and we have a lot of it. So they were, you know, they were listening to the new, uh, the new pop jams. They were getting real sad with our acoustic singer songwriters. Um, so our business only went down three to 5%, which has been great. Um, and, and the biggest, the biggest shift for us that I don't know if it's worked, but we really just are focusing on obviously digital marketing and diff different digital platforms and ways to communicate art digitally rather than in person because you can't really create that experience the same way. And we've had artists get really creative with it, like doing, you know, private Zooms with their top hundred fans and having it be like this, where it's interactive in a conversation with your favorite artists, you know, things like that are engaging. And, and paying for it. And paying for it, yeah. Okay, and so has that led to real money? Um, that's to be determined. There's a couple artists who've done well on the pay gate you know, performances. I would say if you have a big fan base, you can demand payment. If you don't, if you're still a growing artist, it's really hard to get people to pay. Do you have a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay. So 
for those of you who want to stay on, we're at the hour, but let's continue this a little bit longer and feel free to ask questions, guys. So either the chat or the Q&A and I'm happy to answer them. But so as artists, because a, lot, a, a number of the artists that you manage and under networks in, in the network family, mm -hmm. they're not going to be necessarily the, you know, the, <clears throat> the biggest names. And so they're still working artists, right? And touring is such a fundamental part of their revenue stream of just being able to make a living. Yeah. So as they turn to you and say, okay, Rachel, what do we do? What do we do? What do you tell them? Um, I tell them, let's get more music out. The fastest way I know to make money right now is to have a consistent release strategy and get more music out and connect the dots to get you streaming and getting royalties. I know it's a bit of a long pay, but you know, hopefully we can be sending you a royalty check every six months. That's what I want for you. Let's make, let everybody's locked away in their room. They should be creating. Ah, I was just gonna ask you about that. So do you believe that there's gonna be a burst of creativity because people are locked in their rooms? And there already is. The fall is gonna be bananas for releases because you know everybody was stuck and they're like, well, what else am I gonna do with my time? And if they were smart, they made a product and the product is the thing we sell. And it's either their product is either their socials and they're creating branding opportunities with them on socials or it's the music. So did you make a product that we can sell? And are you gonna benefit from the, the, the labor of the fruits of your labor? So okay. that's really what we're focusing on. And uh, Zion, I'm going to ask you a question in a second. Um, and I may be totally wrong on this, but it strikes me with all the societal issues that are going on. So this is a moment of passion. You know, there's real deep emotion. So first of all, like you said, people are listening to more sadder music because they're stuck inside. So you have a pandemic, you have racial strife, you have racial injustice, you have so many things that are going on. Um, uh, Americans split in so many different ways. You would think that there would, this would be a time where there'd be a lot of social, socially driven music, message driven yeah. music. And I personally, and I listen to music 24 seven, I haven't heard that much of that. Yeah. Am I missing something or do you believe that more is coming or what's going on? You know, it's interesting because I thought that would happen, you know, after Donald Trump was elected. I thought there'd be a lot more, you know, music that was reflective of that. Um, I am still hopeful that there will be. I think artists are trying to, but I, I, I don't think anybody's kind of risen to the top. And I think there's a lot of chatter, there's a lot of noise, there's a lot of conversations, but I don't think, you know, for, for lack of a better reference, I don't think there's a new Rage Against the Machine type artist that has come up and really been able to verbalize the, the, the problems and the issues in a, in a way that kind of rallies around it. And I, I want more than anything, I think we all want that, you know, rallying cry and so far nothing. Yeah, no, that it really surprises me because if ever there were a time, my God, you have all these issues that are swirling. Okay, so let's ask this question. What's the relationship between IP and the feeling a song gives to a listener? Oh, that's a great question. So what happens when you feel something? right? When you feel something, you're moved by it. When you're moved by it, you follow it. You're curious. You want to know what happened. You want to, you know, investigate a little bit. I know for me, I don't know if you've ever been listening to a playlist and you listen to 20 songs and then one will just hit and you're like, whoa, what is that? I need to say that on my playlist. I need to remember that song. So that feeling is always is like the ultimate metric for me as an A&R person is that does this song make me feel something? And, and that, that is makes your IP exponentially more valuable. If you can make people feel stuff, your IP is gonna be way more valuable than the background music on a playlist. Very interesting. That, that was a good question. Good answer too, by the way. So any other questions for Rachel? Going, going, okay. No more questions. We could go on for a long, long time. Rachel, thank you very much. I'm going to quickly go for those of you who want to stay on to learn a little bit more about Creative University. Feel free to ask me questions and I'll answer them. I'll answer them right now so you get a little bit more background. Otherwise, I urge you to go to the Creative University website and you saw the link before, but I'll pull that up again. But Rachel is great. So for the first time that we started interacting about a year ago, just wonderful and so knowledgeable about the business. And as you can see, never afraid to take a role, to take a job, to put herself out there. Oh, I didn't ask you the question. What's that? Why, with all this success, are you seeking an executive MBA? 
It's a great, it's a great question. <laughs> so um, I recognize this industry is a bit of a dog and pony show. So it is a lot of uh, smoke and mirrors. It's a lot of important people thinking they're important. Um, I remember getting an email and I was navigating a feature artist, like a rapper to come on a song. And he wrote me back in an incomplete sentence asking for $100,000. And I remember thinking, what kind of industry am I in that that is acceptable? And I remember thinking, I never want to be that person and I need to expand my knowledge in business so that I can compete at a level that I want to, or at least be knowledgeable enough. So it's a general curiosity about being better at business, but also I specifically chose an executive MBA because as opposed to like, you know, a law degree or something very specific, you know, med medicine, et cetera, an executive MBA, it improves your thinking. So I wanted to be a better strategic thinker a more well-rounded professional. And I really felt like that would get me there. And I'm a year into my executive MBA and I will say very strongly that it has. It's added a ton of benefit to my overall business knowledge. And now I feel really confident in trying to connect the dots between the broader business world and this bizarre little creative world we live in. Um, and I think that's really powerful. Was it mostly the understanding the financial aspect of business, would you say? Not just, not just financial. I think that's really helpful. Everything from leadership, marketing, you know, financial, you know, all, the, all those metrics. Um, I think just you can just guide strategically like we're doing like international strategy and entrepreneurship, you know, learning all of those mechanisms that make business work, yeah. knowing what business you are in, knowing how to leverage it, and then using your creativity to maximize those business opportunities. That to me is, is, is a really kind of winning, um, you know, complementary skill set, I guess. And another question I thought of, for the students out there, if they want to stay, if they want to learn more about the music industry or stay on top of developments, mm -hmm. and what are the, and where the world is going in terms of the music business, what are the must read or what are the publications or sources of information that you turn to? Um, I have about like, I can include them in, in like a follow-up link, but there's a lot of just like industry um, newsletters and, you know, informations than everything from like niche market tech findings to, you know, music industry kind of weekly updates to the more billboard um, type publications. There's a lot of industry publications out there that are really smart. And I just use them, they feed into my emails, they make me stay on top of things. Um, yeah, there's probably about like five or 10 that are, are really relevant, I would say. Is that a daily thing for you that you, you sort through that? Like that's, a, that's part of your day where you just stay on top of the ongoing news? Yeah, sometimes, but also we have, um, you know, I, I'm very lucky to work in a knowledge forward company. So we have a Slack and anytime there's industry news that's relevant or there's something interesting or it's an FYI, we'll include it in the Slack channel. So we're always learning from each other because there's it's impossible to just, you know, be, be a lone island. You're really learning from your coworkers. We're always talking about it. You're always sharing cool information. Um, I'm always talking to my digital marketing team, to my sync team, to, you know, my product managers and marketing. Like, like other a &Rs, like we're always talking to understand what's happening in the business and how to stay on top of it. How hard is that these days with everybody locked in their homes? It's actually been really awesome. Slack has been great. Zoom has been great. Um, for me, it's been pretty positive, if I'm being honest, okay. because I, I get more time to um, both think creative by myself in this little room um, and then also, you know, engage with coworkers. I miss people. I miss face to face. Everybody does, but um, I will say just the workflow has been not bad in my world. <laughs> One more question. What school did you select to do your executive MBA? Uh, Simon Fraser in Vancouver, Canada. Okay, and that's where you live? I live here now after 16 years in LA. Yes, I uh, took the plunge out of Los Angeles uh, to move to Canada. <laughs> and do you think that that's gonna adversely impact your just being able to see artists, the, your a and work? Yeah, so before, before this, I was here for, um, I think seven months before I started my executive MBA. Um, I used to fly to LA once a month or fly anywhere. It used to be more relevant to be there 24 seven. Right now, I just strategically, you know, travel there when I need to. And yeah. it's been totally fine. And now with COVID, it's definitely fine.
Okay, so I kept you 10 minutes longer than I said I would, but okay. thanks again. You're great. That was very helpful. I learned a lot. So thanks a lot for coming. Thank you so much, guys. I'll put the video up for everybody in a couple of days. But um, so Rachel, feel free to stick, stay on if you'd like. Uh, I'm going to go through one, one more time for those who want to see. There she is. There's a deck here. And for some reason, I still am not able to share it on the chat function. And we're going to try to figure that out. But if you'd like to get the deck that I went through, um, send a note to Luisa, L-U-I-S-A, L-U-I-S-A at creative, C-R-E-A-T-V, as you see there, creative.media, creative.media. So again, in terms of why we do what we do and why we created this, it's for you guys. It's for you guys. And so we want this to be meaningful. We want you to get great, great voices like Rachel's, learning a lot about the business, but not just learning a lot about the business, giving you special access into the business. And that means real relationships, um, real mentorships, uh, real um, uh, internships as well. And we've already set up, we're already setting up some of these. So real tangible benefits are happening. And so for those of you who really want it, they're out there, they're here. We're here to help you guys. Go to the website, that's how you learn more. There's the link. Um, as I said, Kevin Mayer was the first, uh, just a few weeks ago, it was his first interview after taking over the CEO role over at TikTok. So it's the kind of, um, you know, we're, we wanna bring in all kinds of voices, not just captains of industry, uh, but people who are junior, um, you know, young, um, have done some really interesting things, not just in the business side, on the creative side, like next week's session, but the other kinds of things that I hear, have here. As I mentioned before, the power of relationships, so as you think about submitting your resumes as you go forward in your career, once life gets back to a little bit more normal, although by the way, in the media and entertainment business, there is a lot of hiring in certain aspects of the business right now. Right now, there's a lot, particularly in the tech industry. But as you think about that, it's a very hard industry to break into. And so most typically, unless there's a special relationship of some kind, no matter how good you are, no matter how inspired you are, it's gonna be difficult to get yours on the top of the stack. That's why I take the time, the relationships have been for every speaker that has talked so far, and I'll speak from personal experience, it's the relationship that led to the opportunity that got us to where we wanted to go. And, and by the way, be open-minded about where you wanna go. That's another mission of Creative University is that you may think you wanna be in, you know, at a place like Spotify, but then you learn more about different roles out there, like what Rachel's doing as an example. And maybe you didn't think about that before. And so you think, ah, that's interesting. And you might go down that path and take something that kind of leads you to that. Uh, and then next week, again, urge you to come. This is a special treat to have Ben, Radical Face, who's talking about something completely different, the creative process, but in the music side, but he's not just music. It's all also visual art. And these are the things that you should check out in terms of some prep work for it, for this um, you know, opportunity to have him speak and, real, and answer questions and all of that. So these videos will be a good start. These are two of my favorite songs. Rachel mentioned Welcome Home, and that's his best known song. Uh, that's the one she was discussing today. And then the upcoming sessions after that, as I mentioned, Jeff Clanagan, who's the president of Kevin Hart's Laugh Out Loud Network, deeply experienced, obviously. Sarah Harden, CEO of Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine, that's August 11th. Um, already confirmed are so many others, but one of the head creative executives over at HBO Max is going to be on in the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, Jenny Morris, she's great. Uh, she's responsible for content, that's HBO Max. Obviously, HBO Max just entered a massively crowded field. So it's going to be interesting just to have that backdrop as she discusses her journey and what led her to where she is. There will be some actual like teaching sessions. Um, I've given one so far that was about the music industry, by the way. It's where the music industry is today and where it's going in the future. That's actually, I have that on demand. There's a video of that session and you can get that at the Creative University website. I think that could be pretty pretty helpful. There was good feedback on that. There's a lot of information. And then some of the things that I really urge you to do, if you really want it, and look at what um, Rachel lives it. Rachel lived it, and that's what got her to a very satisfying and fulfilling place in her career, a really cool gig, is 
She put in the time. She was tenacious. She made it happen. So these are curated uh, companies, um, podcasts that I believe that you will get real, really something out of them. Road Trip Nation, it's a very a fascinating company that's actually, its programs are already incorporated into 50% of the high schools out there in the United States. And I had never heard of it. But if you check out the mission, which is wondering what to do with your life and helping you get your own answers to that, it's fascinating. Check it out. Uh, these are the songs I already mentioned. Uh, check out the new Creative University YouTube channel with the full playlist of uh, different sessions we've had so far. I really urge you also to check out last week's session with Randy Commissar. Randy's was, um, again, the art of creating a life while making a living. So he's a venture capitalist at Kleiner Perkins, which is considered to be the blue chippiest of venture capital firms uh, in, in the world, really. And so you would think that you know, you would probably have your own preconceived notion of what a venture capitalist is like. Randy breaks all those. And that's not what he talks about. He talks about his nonlinear journey, which that's just one part of his life. It's fascinating. It's real. The feedback was tremendous. Um, and then I was listening to Michael Lewis again today. Michael Lewis is Moneyball, um, The Big Short, one of the best known authors in the United States, best selling one after the other. Um, and, and season two of his podcast, Against the Rules, is something that you'll get a lot out of. It's all about coaching and coaching in different ways, including data driven coaching. And that will be fascinating in and of itself. It doesn't sound fascinating, but trust me, it is. It's really good. You'll get a lot out of it. Um, and then the spotlight question. I haven't had many responses to this yet, but you're in the middle of this right now, guys. I know we are with our own daughter who's a junior at USC. What is your plan for the upcoming school year? You know, we want to provide, we want to give you benefits while you're, we want to give you some um, real interesting things to focus on, um, opportunities, stories, guests, while you're going through all this, but also some of you may not continue. Some of you may be taking leave of absences, I don't know, and you're going to be looking for different ways to um, pursue your passions during that, this crazy time. So the spotlight question is, what's your plan for the upcoming school year? I really want to hear them. Others and the other students really want to hear them. Submit your answer. Just do it via, take a quick video. Just take a quick video of yourself and send it to Luisa at creative.media. It will be very interesting to do. Would like to get that. And then, as I mentioned, this is the, the fundamental ask we have. We're here for you. We're happy to give our time. We're thrilled to give our time to those who express passion and really want to make it. It's democratized access. This is for anybody who's passionate and tenacious and good. It doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter what school you go to, we wanna give you an immediate opportunity that's real. So it's democratized access. That's a fundamental part of this, but you gotta help us help you in the inimitable words of Jerry Maguire. And then read my book. That's another part of just background that it, it goes, it's, it's an easy read. It covers all the aspects of the media business, including music, but video, um, esports, uh, immersives, virtual reality, augmented reality, and all that. And it's a PDF that we'll send you for free. Um, but I, I think you'll get a lot out of it because it's not just about where the business is today to give you a grounding on all of that, but also it talks about where it's going in the future and also gets into some of the meta issues of this digital society that we live in and how important it is to be analog at times too. And then on Monday, our new partner that we're discussing a partnership with, One Day Immersion, for those of you who are interested in film production and producing films, they're having a session, the introduction to film producing. You can see, go to onedayimmersion.com forward slash, you'll see the URL there and sign up for that way. It sounds really interesting. Brian, I don't know Brian, but he's uh, produced four feature films. Um, including two that are being distributed right now on Amazon Prime Video. So I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating story. And then send your homework responses, applications to apply for mentorships, internships, 
if you want those, if you want the tangible, those kind of benefits and not just the benefit of listening to Rachel and the other great speakers, but if you, we need to learn more about you. And so that's why we need this from you to demonstrate that you're committed to this, you really want it. And so we learn more about you so we can help you identify the best possible opportunity. Send to Louisa at creative.media. Uh, and that's it guys. Any, any more questions before we go? Let's see. I do have a couple. Um, okay, so we have Adam, uh, uh, was saying that regarding the Randy Commissar video last week, Peter's right, he was great. He gave some solid insights into how to think about the pandemic. My favorite quote was, everyone's been woken up and we're trying to go back to sleep. Think about that. Very meta, very true. He encouraged people to use this time to really think outside of the box and take risks we wouldn't otherwise. Really great attitude, really great outlook. So true. Nobody's going to be asking you two years from now, like, what, what did you do with your time during the summertime while you're thinking it through? They're not going to be penalizing you for um, doing something that you think is expected of you. There, but the creativity of trying something different, putting yourself out there, really going for it, like uh, you know, Rachel has, that will, that will be very beneficial to you. Okay, another one. Um, from Emily, the music industry is whatever you want to make of it. Absolutely so true. Uh, Jackson Ham, great guy, great musician, by the way, great musician um, from LA, but going to school or was going to school in New York City. Uh, so uh, let's see. Martin Meyer says, thank you so much. Listening from Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town, haven't been there, have traveled a lot, haven't been in Cape Town, need to get there. As soon as things open up again, we're off, if you'll have us. Uh, thoughts on Submit Hub, paying $1 to submit to blogs, playlists, et cetera. Uh, I don't know if Rachel's still on, probably not, but Rachel, if you are on, ah, wonderful. Any thoughts on Submit Hub? Yeah, I think it's actually a really good way to get in front of bloggers and bloggers help inform bigger press. So if you don't have a lot going on and you've got a little bit of a budget, we, we've used it in the past actually quite a bit. Um, and it gets kind of the low level press that you probably wouldn't pitch for, like our publicists probably wouldn't pitch for it, but um, it kind of gets all the bubbling press that we call feeder press that then feeds into something hopefully bigger. So I think it's totally meaningful. And it, and it makes sure that, you know, you get through the door by paying a dollar, so. Excellent. Rachel, thanks for hanging on, by the way. So uh, will you be sharing the link to this post to post this event? Yes, I will be sharing. Go to the Creative University website in a couple days. I'll have my crack editing team, which is in the other room over here, <laughs> working on it as we speak. From uh, another one, if you are from a 17 hour flight away, South Africa, how do you present the one pager to get you to look at? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, Martin. Uh, send me a note because I'm not clear on that question. Uh, Emily says, this fall is going to be bananas. Said in a very Gwen Stefani-ish kind of way. So true. If you don't know that reference, go to her first album after she left the band. Um, given the new platforms that the new platforms that help with emerging artists, how do you see the future of A&R? Well, by the way, if anybody's interested in that, I wrote an article for Forbes, I think. It might've been Forbes, it might've been Variety, but I wrote an article about that, about what artists can do right now while they're locked in, and it's not just live streaming. It gets into immersive things like um, Travis Scott's Fortnite event that was seen by, I think over 30 million people. Uh, I think it was 30 million people. So think about that. And so uh, Marshmallow did a Fortnite event about a year ago, which broke the mold. Travis Scott comes in, he does his Fortnite event, and it's all the talk of the town. So think about that, uh, that opportunity for those artists. Now, those are big name artists, but they're able to get major sponsorship dollars and also all the press and visibility because they were entrepreneurs, because they were trying something new. They were breaking the mold, and so everybody's talking about it. You know what that does to their music? People start listening. So it's brilliant moves, brilliant moves. Um, let's see, Rachel says, oh, that's good, good to hear. 
Uh, ben, thank you for your comment. Um, Kristen, thank you for your comment. Any final, I'm gonna check. I think there might be another one on the Q and A. Let's see. Uh, I think that's it guys. But if you have any follow-up questions, just send them. Send them to Louisa at creative.media. And um, like that article that I mentioned, it's in Variety, just Variety is a industry publication. I think it's Variety, not Forbes. So just search Variety, my name, um, live streaming, and Travis Scott, and then you'll find the article. All right? Thanks, everybody. Next week, Radical Face, do it. You'll be glad you did. Incredible. And listen to his songs. It may or may not be your thing, but nonetheless, uh, my favorite artist of the last five years. Stream more than anybody. Oh, there's two new messages. So if you want to leave, that's fine. For those of you who want to stay on, that's great. Uh, okay. Well, there it is. See you guys.